I'm gonna do a little bit of a demo on how to have a character grab an object. I have done a video on this before, how to do constraints and set that up. So there's a few videos on that, but today I'm just gonna focus on having this particular character, which is the Thor rig uh, from Agora and the hammer, two separate rigs. I'm gonna do a little scene where he, he does the thing where he puts his hand out, the hammer comes to it, he grabs it, he can swing it around and then he can throw it. We maintain control in just the right way over all the stuff and then he can uh, re-grab it and things like that. I've just done a second ago, we did the hand pose for grabbing, which I'll talk about later, but I just keyed it over here so I don't have to re-key it. So frame one, we just have this. I'm gonna go ahead and just relax the hand a little bit. I'll just key the character one more time just to make sure nothing changes. In three frames, I'll have him bring his arm up and I'm just gonna do kind of a straight ahead attempt. And this isn't gonna be beautiful animation, but this is just gonna be kind of the idea. So generally, I feel like the pinky sticks out further than most of the other fingers. So that's what I'm gonna do here. So that's how my hand is at least. My pinky goes out a lot further. Um, certain fingers tend to kind of clump and bunch up. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and just key everything on this hammer. And I'm gonna say it takes five frames and I'm gonna go ahead and just Now I'm actually gonna uh, just snap it on, do that. So what I did there, I did not lock, like they're not constrained, they're not attached. People might think, whoa, how'd you attach it that quickly? I didn't attach it. So what I did here is I just used the uh, Animbot Align to Selection to stick the hammer to the, the hand. Comes up, and then the hammer will show up. It'll fly in. I'm trying to think long term. There's a few ways to do this. So here's, here's what's in my head right now. I could just, like I could use this little prop thingy, which is what it's usually meant for. It's, it's meant to be used for constraints. I could attach the hammer to that, and I could use this main controller to do it because then it'll rotate from the proper spot and it'll all work just fine. What that'll do though, is as long as the hammer is held by Thor, I will not be able to use this controller to move the hammer because it will be following, all of its inputs will be following that little manipulator thingy, which is probably fine because the his hand is what's gonna be moving it. If I need to do extra animation, I do have this, this internal one that I can mess with. So that's probably just fine. Perhaps I'm overthinking. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and go for this. So I'm gonna say, you are in charge of you as of frame 15, so I'm gonna switch to animation and I'm gonna go constrain, parent constraint, and then I'm gonna make sure that my settings are good. So blend parent one, let me key that here. And then I'll set it off uh, 10 on frame 10. So what I've just done is I constrained it on frame 15 and then I went back to frame 10 and noticed that, that at first it, it still had it in his hand, but that's just because it turned the constraint on for all time. And I don't want that. It didn't, it wasn't constrained five frames ago. That's when I had it start moving. So I turned the blend parent off. So it's, it's not parented. Now what I do, that is what my animation for this hammer was at. However, now the blend is handling it. On frame 10, my control of this hammer is absolute. I have full power over the hammer. But by frame 15, that blend parent, the constraint, it takes over by 15. So I actually have no power. So I can say it should go over here. doesn't matter. It's there. The constraint is in charge by frame 15. So the closer we are to frame 10, the more power I have. The closer to frame 15, the less power I have. So the fact that I have this hammer animated doesn't make a difference. So if I look at the animation curves for this, this is frame 10, this is frame 15. I can just zero this out, which in theory means that the hammer doesn't move from 10 to 15, it stays put. But as long as on frame 15, I set the blend parent to one, you now see there's another curve. That's the blend parent, that's the constraint. So from 10 to 15, whoop, it goes over. The animation of the hammer says that it's still over here in place, but it's not. The constraint is taken over. So same kind of thing. So now I'm just telling, you can actually see the, the animation here. Now what the hammer thinks it's doing is going up and going down. If I turn the blending off, here's what's happening. It's going up and down. That's the animation I have put on it. But by 15, again, the constraint has taken over. And so it ends up looking kind of like a blend of the two. This is an important thing just to get your head around when you're doing constraints is that when you activate a constraint on something, you lose control over it once the constraint is active. And so you wanna make sure that the animation you have on the object already or that you're gonna put on the object works with the constraint if you are blending from your power, your animation to the constraints position. You have to make sure those two blend into each other nicely. 
Uh, otherwise, you're going to have something like moving in a weird way. And you think, why is that moving? And you're going to try to mess with it and you don't have power over it. And you're wondering why it's because of the constraint and you are fighting. The other thing, though, that's that's different is if you aren't blending. So I'm doing a 10 to 15. I'm doing a frame 10 to frame 15 blend. But what if we weren't? What if I was doing a one frame toggle on frame 14? The hammer's not connected. And on frame 15, it connects, right? Now it just pops over. Uh, a blend can help smooth that transition, but it introduces that whole concept of blending animation. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to just set this to zero. And I'm going to do what I did before. I'm just going to do it the, the cleanest way I know how, which is on frame 15. I'm just going to act like I animated it to be over here. So this is my animation. 10 to 15. Oh, it looks like it's spinning in an interesting way. Don't really want that. I'm assuming that's some kind of an Euler, Euler filter type thing. I think it's that the hammer is like just oriented backwards from where it wants to be. So what I can try to do is I can see if an Euler filter will help me. And it mostly does. It still spins and it's fine. Really, like I don't really care what this was before. So what I can just do is make these other keys just match. So now it's just rotated that way to match in the first place, right? Or I can just set my own rotation and say, maybe I want it to go like this, right? Kind of have a little bit of a, a turn as it comes over. I think maybe you even push it a little further. And I'm actually going to change this. I actually want it to come over like that. And then at the last second, turn into his hand. So I want it to kind of come handle first and then bam, right into his hand. Connect. Uh, the Euler filter is something in the graph editor that same idea with the clock. If you're looking at, at a regular clock and the, the 12 hand is on top, right? That's 12 noon, 12 hours pass. You're looking at 12 AM, right? It's the same radial position on a clock, but technically it means something different. It means 360 degrees of rotation have occurred on the clock hand. Animation's the same way. You can have something look exactly the same rotation wise because it was zero degrees and 360 degrees. They both line up. They look the same, but there is a rotation that has to happen to get you there. So when you have an object go from, you know, a value that looks like this and the arm say on frame 20, your arm is posed like this. And then on frame 40, your arm is posed like this. It looks almost the same. They're roughly the same pose. But then you hit play and between 20 and 40, it goes, it like does all this weird stuff. You're like, what the heck happened to my animation? Why is the curve doing all this stuff? The pose looks right. It's because it's going from 12 to 12. It's doing the 360 degrees. It's doing all that crazy stuff. And it ends up in almost the same pose. They look the same. They're just off an octave. It's like an octave of motion. The Euler filter looks for that kind of stuff and just corrects it, brings it to the same playing field of like, oh, well, you don't actually need to spin 360 degrees. We just have to reduce the value by 360 degrees or something of that equivalent. That's a rough idea of how the Euler filter works. It just takes 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. and makes them both 12 a.m. or makes them both 12 p.m. Hopefully that was a good explanation. What we're looking at right now, this exact moment in time, is the animation I put on the hammer. We just saw me do it. The, the hammer is over here on frame 10 and on frame 15, it moves over here, right? And I even customized the, the interpolation to have it kind of go handle first and then slide into his hand and rotate into his hand for the last second, right? So bam, there's my animation. That's what I want. Now, if on frame 10, I keyed this and then I say, okay, frame 15, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the constraint. Bam. That's this gray line, zero to one, off to on. Blend parent one is now on. So my constraint is active. If I move his arm, the everything comes with it. It's great. It's working. But here's the deal. The way I have it set up is that I had it keyed on frame 10. So on 10, it's off and on 15, it's on. We know that it's going to try and blend from 10 to 15 and reduce my influence as it gets closer to 15. But I had a lot of work already in there. So what I like to do is check on frame, say 13, somewhere in the middle. I like to take this and say, okay, like, does this make a difference? Because remember how I said that we have two choices. We can either blend from 10 to 15, or we can just turn it on and off 14 to 15. Option A is blending. Option B is snapping. 
Now, the thing that's important is if I kind of look between the two options, option A, option B, A, B, A, B, A, B, the most important thing to notice is that they are different. We are seeing a difference in the motion. The reason why we're seeing that is because, as I showed before, when they're blending, frame 10, I have full control, frame 15, the constraint has full control. So in between, my control over the object with my animation is lessening as we get closer to 15, where the constraint takes over fully. I had animation all set up all the way up to frame 15. I messed with the interpolation of the curves. I wanted the handle to do a specific thing on the hammer. But all that work on frame 13 and 14 is getting pretty close to 15. The constraint's starting to take over and override all that work that I did with its basic interpolation. And so that's how we see that if I, if I allow the computer to do that, we get this. My animation had it looking like this. It helps me to make a decision as the artist, do I do a blend or do I do a snap? Sometimes it doesn't matter. In this case, it matters. So I'm gonna do a snap because I don't want the computer taking over. I wanna have full control all the way up to frame 14 and then bam, on frame 15, we both agree. The constraint and I have the same animation on frame 15, so it doesn't matter on that frame. But on 14, I still care. So I keep the constraints influence off. So that helps me to know as the animator, when do I do a blend and when do I not do a blend? I'm glad I'm recording right now. <laughs> this might end up being a video on the channel some of the tips and tricks of this kind of stuff. Puts his hand up, hammer comes in, bam. And we are linked at this point. So whatever we do, we're good to go. But we have more work to do. So let's go ahead and say frame 15. I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I have his body keyed on 15. Because I'm doing straight ahead on certain frames, I might end up on like frame 50 and be like, oh, I think on frame 50, I'll move his arm up. But it's important at times when you're using this type of a workflow to lock things down as you go. Not necessarily everything, but certain things. For example, on frame 15, I told the hammer to be in this exact position so it lines up with his hand. But if on frame 15, say I, I end up moving something, well, that's going to break this. See how it now has to do something different? Remember on frame 15, the constraint is in charge and the constraint says that it's in his hand. From 14 to 15, there's a one frame snap saying that if that hand moves, it kind of breaks that illusion and now the whole point of me doing a one frame snap is kind of broken and it's like, oh, well, I should have done a blend because then it would have blend to this spot and it's not procedural. It doesn't matter. My point is, for now, I know I like this. I don't want this arm or his body to accidentally move later. And so I need to grab his entire body and key him on frame 15 to lock this pose in. Hopefully this is making sense. So moving right along. Hmm. There are two ways I could have done this and I made my choice early without really talking about it. So I could have linked the hammer to the hand so that the hammer follows the hand. That's what I did. So if I move the arm, that the hammer will follow. Another thing I could have done is switched his arm to IK and then locked the hand to the hammer. I could have done that instead, meaning that I would have moved the hammer and then his hand would have followed along with it. There's benefits to each. I'm trying to think right now if I did it the way I like. So right now it's gonna be really easy to swing his arm around and get like nice overlap and it's gonna make the hammer follow. I think it's fine. I think it'll work just fine. If I had a very specific path for the hammer to take, then maybe I would have done it the other way because then I could just move the hammer where I want it to go. I don't know if it really matters at this moment. There are going to be reasons why you want to do one or the other. But in this case, I'm just going to move forward with what we've got. Although I do think a few things would have been easier if I'd done it the other way. It's fine. It's fine. I'll make it work. Just animate like you intended then smooth out the hammer trail by motion trail. You can't do that because the hammer is following the arm. So... If you turn on the motion trail for the hammer, you're going to have to use the arm to correct the hammer's motion trail. That's the thing that makes it tricky, is the motion of the hammer and the arc of the hammer is no longer up to the hammer. It's up to the arm because it's following the arm, which is why a lot of the times with things like this with swords and whatever, it is a very common workflow to parent the hand to the object because then you can get a very clean, you can do that. You can track the arc of the hammer, of the sword tip, of whatever, and control that exactly and then the hand just follows along because that's less important so it's that balance but for now this is how i'm going to go ahead and do this i already had a pose created for that so i'm just going to bring that over bam and i'm going to have to adjust it a little bit it's fine it's not a good pose anymore but i don't really care <laughs> that's not what this is about moving on i'm going to spend way too much time on this this rig is available on agora community oh you know what i should i should make a link to it there we go you have an exclamation point agora a-g-o-r-a -A. exclamation point agora yeah, Agora is going to be a really big resource. People are going to love. So I want to take a note. because So here's what I want to happen. I want the hammer to come in and I want it to like push in on his 
on his body. I want the hammer to come in and hold, the whole shockwave is felt through the upper body. Now this would be a lot easier if, if I had the hand and IK stuck to the hammer and I could just move the hammer over, but I didn't do it that way. So I need to make sure I'm, I'm thinking ahead here. So I want to keep track of the spacing of this hammer. So frame 13, frame 14, and then frame 15. Actually, I'm not a huge fan of where frame 15 is. Because if you look at the spacing, actually, let me go back to 12 and see where 12 is at. So 12 is off screen. So spacing wise, this distance and this distance, obviously very different. This means high speed. This me means it's slowing down. Um, and I don't want that. I want the hammer coming in at full speed full speed bam and hitting his and hitting him so i actually do think i want to change frame 15 which was my like anchor frame i think i think i want to change it let's see the main point of the hammer right there i'll have that line up here and that's going to be like his forearm bulge muscle thing so that's where i'll aim to have it happen but i'll have it happen on frame 15 so that he has his hand out and on frame 15 pff, it's the exact frame it hits because right now it's kind of hitting on frame 15 and then he's grabbing it on 16. And I don't think I want that. Oh, what's the software? Yes, this is called Epic Pen. Epic Pen, yeah, it's there in the chat. It is free, but you can pay, I think like 10 bucks or 15 bucks or something to get the premium features, which I have, because I wanted the more colors and things, but yeah, it's... I'm just gonna delete these two frames of animation and I'm just gonna change frame 15. So what I'm gonna do, yeah, this is kind of dumb. I should have just done this first. Rather than changing all the posing stuff, I'll put it here. I'm just gonna do this. Now it doesn't slow down. I mean, that's way easier than re having to redo the, the stuff. So I can keep the rest the same, actually. So I'm actually gonna take these three controls, or these four controls, key them on 14, and then on 15, I'm actually gonna change it up. There. So I want it to feel like he's when he's grabbing it, it's kind of compressing his arm, and that's working pretty well. It'd be much easier in IK to have this all work nicely, and then I could switch him, but he doesn't seem to have an FKFK snap, and so I don't wanna deal with it. I'm just going to try and fix this up a little bit. There, that's a, that's better. I like that better. That's not comfortable. It's not what you want. So that's actually a perfect example of the Euler filter at work. This is exactly what I was talking about by the first and the second. Like, I'm switching between the two poses. See that? Same exact pose. But if you look at the animation between them, there's a big old gap. There's a big difference. Everything's elevated. And so you end up with this horrible broken finger motion. And so what you do is you use the Euler filter to take those controls and reduce them back to a normal. It's the same thing, but now it doesn't have that problem. So that's what the Euler filter is good for. Should I order a review for a walk cycle or is that a waste of money and effort since it's only an exercise? I don't see why not. I mean, if you're working on a walk cycle and you need feedback, go for it. There's really no, like, it's not dumb to get feed. Should somebody order a review for a, for a ball bounce? If you don't have a way to get good feedback on a ball bounce or you want a professional opinion on it, then like, yeah. Like, does it matter that like you could, you could get a ball bounce and somebody else might be getting like a dragon visual effect shot? Like, it doesn't really matter because you both need that feedback. You're in different places. You know what I mean? So if you need the feedback on a walk cycle, get the feedback on a walk cycle. Don't feel like you shouldn't get feedback just because you think the assignment is kind of basic or something like that. Everyone starts in the same place and we all need feedback to get better. So here is where he grabs the hammer. By grab Thaw's hammer. By grab Thaw's hammer. What a savings. Here's the frame before. I probably should have dialed it down a little bit, but whatever. And then here's the frame before that. So it's actually speeding up into his hand. It's actually, you know, see the distance here to here and then here to here. It's actually getting faster. It's going longer distances the closer we get so here bam the fact that he catches it what should the next two frames look like because i want to do maybe two frames of recoil so we had we had frame you know a b now it's got to slow down it's got to slow down a lot we need c and d now because i want to do two frames of of stoppage now the thing with it is if we're going to slow down we need the gaps between b and c and c and d B was really fast, it was really long. So there's this big, big giant whoosh before B. C's gotta be less than that. So this needs to be less than that one. And then D is getting even slower. So it needs to even be less there. So if you think of spacing like math, I don't know if anyone here wants to think of spacing like math, but if you wanna be able to figure out like the formula for animation here and figure out like, what do you have to do? You don't have a choice for motion. 
it's that the distance traveled, the spacing, you know, from this frame to this frame, that's got to be the biggest one. Now it needs to get, let's say, maybe like here and then here. Does that work? It's like, okay, we have this big one, smaller, smaller. This is bigger than that, is bigger than that. That's our little equation here. Now, if this were IK, I'd just move it over a little bit and it'd actually be really easy. I kind of regret not doing that, but oh well, what are you going to do? So in the posing, I'm thinking of a few things. When he gets pushed this way, the shoulder's got to compress. The arm has to go down and this has to come up in order to reduce this distance. If I've got to have the hammer come closer to his face, is that accordion? And then for the hand, it's coming in a direction and I want him to turn his wrist this way to catch it. And also because the giant hammerhead on top, that's going to have more weight than the bottom. So it's got to kind of come more on the bottom than it does on the or on the top than on the bottom. So these are all kind of just some different physics things that I'm thinking of. And for the most part, that's fine. I do need to deal with his upper body. So I'm going to go ahead and push his entire upper body over like that. I actually do the same thing here just a little bit. And then I'm going to just go like that. So right here, what I'm doing is I was just pushing over a few of his body parts. I was trying to, um, so I have the hammer come in and move this arm, but I also moved his upper body a little bit and I torqued it over. I had his whole kind of upper body move, rotate and translate. I also had his left arm kind of pop out and I even had his head kind of go, right? Um, because I wanted it to feel so here, when I moved his body over, I actually moved his head back. So it's like his body moves, but his head hasn't moved it yet. And then I added that kind of overshoot to his head to catch back up and come back. So when the hammer hits, kind of feels like the shock wave that his head, his upper body and his arm all kind of react separately and delayed. And it's not a lot and I'll probably have to redo a lot of it, but it's just a tiny little jolt of energy that I definitely need to adjust later, but it's just something for now to remind myself that I want to do it. Actually, his head kind of locks in place right here. 17 and 18, the head stays in the same spot. I don't like that. It's too far. His head shouldn't move backwards. It should just... I probably should have done less work on this to block it in. This is getting closer to more spliny polishy stuff, but I wanted to just show what that might look like. So now when the hammer hits, you kind of feel that little jolt of energy through his upper body because his head moves at a slightly different, like it kind of moves his upper body and pushes that without his head coming along for the ride until it catches up. Hi, Luna. Hi. What does she want? Hello. Oh, hello. Mwah. Hello, kitty cat. So there's, there's the initial, that's kind of the basic setup for setting up the constraint. Um, that was a really long demo for just a constraint. But the other thing you could do so if you want him to throw the hammer, uh, to throw the hammer, you kind of have two options. One option is you can just use this, like you can't use this control. This control, do whatever you want to do with it, but it's not going to work. Uh, because like we talked about earlier, the constraint is in charge. The constraint controls what that character does uh, or, or what that rig does, that hammer. However, we do have this control. And technically you could have him throw this. <laughs> And you can animate it doing all this stuff. But the problem is it doesn't actually work very well because if I move his arm, the hammer's still attached to it. It has this, this secondary control in here. That's not really for throwing. This is for if you need the hammer to start shaking, moving, if you need to adjust the position. Right now, you can't really do any of that. The hammer's in his hand and it's locked to his hand. If you need to have that hammer adjust where it's at, you can use this one to do that. You know, like if you wanted to drag... You can use that to drag it and then just repose the fingers, you know, where you want, where you want this to happen like that. I'll just kind of cheat and go like this. So you can see that I, I can kind of make the hand do a different pose with the hammer. Now it's just kind of, now it's more of a saggy pose in his hand, but it's not for throwing because it's just, it's the secondary control. And now that's what you can use to animate just the hammer within the grip you're going to have to ultimately use this main control to move it. So what you'll have to do in that situation, if I just go to frame 50, you have two options. Again, if you want to turn off the constraint and go back to the thing not being constrained, or if, if, you, want, if you want to throw it. Option number one is what you would normally, it would be the thing you normally think to do, which is to just turn off the, the constraint. 
And then when you're ready, turn it back on. Bloop. That works, except for you see it just fly away and go back to where it was originally. Now, technically, like, you could get away with that because we could just turn this off. And then on this, on this frame, we just say, like, hey, go to where you're supposed to be. Let's copy the data. So now, the reason that it was jumping back to that old spot is because it went back to the constraints not in charge, we're in charge. What was the last thing we did with the hammer? We animated it to the hand. That was the last place we left it, so it went right back to where it was. So we just changed the, the position of the hammer, and we're good to go. Now you turn it on and off, and you're fine. Now you can see the constraint is off. The hammer is now um, able to be freely animated. So now... Right? So see, we have the hammer animate in, constrain to the hand, move around with the body, and then unlock, and then we can move it separately and bring it back. And that's one way to do it. And then when we're ready to reactivate the constraint, as long as we're in the, pretty much the exact same spot, it doesn't matter. Since we're using that hand prop thing and I have Anabot to just lock the rig of the hammer directly to the exact same transformation of the, um, what do you call it? Of that like prop hand control thing. I know they're always in the same spot, so it really doesn't matter to me. As long as it's in the same hand, I can keep the same same strength. Can't, ugh, I can keep the same constraint going every time. But the other the other way to do it. So that was one way to do it. I said there were two ways to do the hand and the hammer disconnecting to throw it around. The second option, if you decide you want the hammer to lock onto something else, or if you want to just create a new constraint to be able to move it freely without any any connection to the hand. Or if you wanted to have him throw it with one arm and then catch it with the other arm, all these different situations, um, the other way to do it, I don't know. You basically put a locator wherever you want. Like if I wanted to have him disconnect from the hammer up here, I could create a locator and I'll tell it on frame, I'll say, say frame 68. So here, here, constrain, parent constraint, bam. I have to be careful because you can see now where my constraint was working perfectly before, it's now kind of broken. It's being pulled by this constraint. It's it's doing both. Both constraints are now active all the time. I just have to make sure that the locator is active. I now have to manage. I man I have to now manage two constraints. So on frame 68, I turn off the hand constraint and I turn on the locator constraint on frame 67. I turn on the hand. Oops. And I turn off the locator. As long as I do that properly, it's not a problem. So I have to just, it's just one more step. But what it allows you to do is to say on a certain frame, I want to transfer ownership of the hammer. We have a manually animated hammer, right? He, he moves, we animated the hammer, bam. We now give control of the hammer to the constraint on the hand. He moves around. We disconnect it and we allow the animation of the hammer ourselves. We just animate the hammer directly to do its thing. Then we give control back to the hand. Then we come up here and on frame 68, I transfer ownership to the locator. If I were to just move the arm from this point, I'd have a problem because they're not connected. I have to give ownership back to the hand. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go back to the, the hammer. So I'll key those and frame this one, one, zero. Zhu, zhu. Then I give ownership back and then I can put it back down. It comes down to this. When you first have your character grab an object, your first choice is when you make a constraint, do you blend into that constraint or do you snap into that constraint over one frame? We talked about that earlier. Then you animate your character. Then you need to disconnect it. Do you just disconnect the constraint that exists and take over the animation like we did before, just animating the object itself with its controls and then reconnect it? Or do you do the second option, which is transfer ownership of that object to a locator or some other object so that a new constraint takes over and then gives it, gives it back. So those are the, the two inflection points when you're doing this type of a uh, shot. Hopefully this was helpful. Adding one more thing to the recording, after using my brain for but a moment and realizing how this is set up, one of the best benefits to this rig is that it's using these little hand hand control 
uh, prop control things. So this little thing in here that I've been using to align the hammer with using Animbot, whatever. This thing is what's actually controlling the hammer and the, the hammer control is constrained to it. That's what I've been using. Um, so if you're gonna have the, the if you're gonna have him throw the hammer, he doesn't even have to disconnect the constraint system. You literally just animate this thing going all around, and then when you're done, you want to go back to normal. You just zero out the controls. You just go back to this. That oh, wait a minute. By default, it may not work because when you move his arm, it follows. But if you go to that control and turn off follow, let's see. Yeah, then it becomes a world space thing. So that actually, never mind. My other ways that I showed before were better. I thought of this at the very beginning, and so I didn't show this. And then I forgot and explained how this is so much better. But then I remembered that. And so therefore, never mind. Forget everything. <laughs> Just go back to how, remembering, go back to remembering the rest of the demo that I showed earlier. But I sh figured I should probably address this. So yeah, hopefully this was useful to you. And I have been recording this whole time, so perhaps this will find its way onto a YouTube video. I'm going to hit stop on the recording now.